Before we get started, I wanted to share that Hometown History is brought to you by Swanson Health. When it comes to vitamins, my motto is that I am not putting something in my body unless I'm completely confident in its quality. I look for brands that are well established and have been trusted for decades. This is why I use Swanson Health. They've been producing quality vitamins and supplements for over 50 years, seriously, since 1969. Swanson Health also stands out from the crowd because they only support products that they themselves are proud to use and give to their own families. They call it their Swanson Quality Code. Swanson Health carries over 18,000 wellness products at a great value. Pick up all your favorite health products plus discover new ones for your wellness routine. Personally, I'm an avid user of their Energy C. It's an effervescent vitamin C drink mix that has a really good citrus flavor. I simply add it to my bottle of water each morning. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code HOME20 for 20% off site-wide and free shipping on orders over $50 at swanson.com. That's S-W-A-N-S-O-N dot com. Promo code H-O-M-E 20. Home 20. Honestly, I'm not even sure what to do with this one. We're talking about Terrare, the 18th century French showman and show eater, and one of the least lovely and most helpless people in all of human history. He was born in 1772 and died in 1798. Tarare died young because his addictions consumed him and just about everything else he could get his hands on. And the more you read about him, the less he sounds like a real person, the more he sounds like a mythical beast from a medieval book of morals. He sounds almost like a demon from the glutinous circle of hell in Dante's Inferno, more than he does a human being. The terms polyphagia and hyperphagia were used by doctors to describe Terrari's disorder, and they basically just mean an abnormally strong appetite. And like most attempts to describe Terrari, these medical terms were prone to understatement. Even saying he's a misfit is like saying the burning of the Library of Constantinople was a minor lapse in judgment. Terrare ate a baby. Not because he had a special preference for this, or because he liked the taste, but because he ate everything. Like, everything. If he could fit it in his mouth, or break it into pieces, small enough to fit into his mouth, he ate it and his mouth could fit an enormous amount. His jaws were wide set and almost unhinged, so they stretched like an anaconda's. They could open a four-inch gap to allow him to swallow large objects whole. And yet he was skinny to the end of his life. He could hold 12 eggs in his mouth at once, or 12 apples. And the skin of his cheeks was so used to these giant mouthfuls that it sagged and wrinkled when his mouth was empty. But it rarely wrinkled for long because Terrare almost never stopped eating. He stopped to sleep, we think, but the rest of his waking life was spent eating and finding the next thing to eat. In order to eat for free, and to fund the next meal, he put on shows as a street performer. He would dare people to fill him up, and anything they offered, he ate. They brought out whole chickens and legs of lamb. They brought baskets of corks, silverware, rocks, and Terrare ate it all. They also brought him live snakes and lizards and litter of kittens and puppies and he ate those too, like a wild animal, while they were alive, and he later vomited their fur, just like a hawk might.
By the way, the name Terrari was a stage name, probably rooted in the common French phrase, Bomb Bomb Terrari, which was set at that time to celebrate loud noises or explosions. Dr. Jan Bondesen, a Swedish rheumatologist who has studied this case, suggests that Terrari's name is derived from this tribute to loud explosions. In reference to his legendary flatulence, seriously, his farts were so memorable that he was named after them. Yikes. As Terrari's fame grew, he joined a troupe of traveling prostitutes and sideshow acts before later enlisting in the French army, in which the French general Alexander de Beauharnais, under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte, tried to use him as a spy. They tested Terrari's abilities by having him swallow a wooden box containing pieces of paper, with the idea of using him as a kind of human carrier pigeon who might carry a box of valuable documents to the enemy territory, deep in the folds of his mysterious insides. When Terrari passed the test, literally, I mean by passing it right through his digestive tract, he was rewarded with a wheelbarrow full of raw bull's liver and lungs, which he promptly devoured by the fistful. Satisfied with this horrific display, the general sent Terrari into action, in which he was almost immediately captured and tortured by his German captors. But this was really the general's fault. Terrari's appearance made him stand out even in the largest of crowds, and he didn't speak a word of German. It's hard to imagine a worse combination for a spy. By the time his captors discharged him, after a few mock executions, Terrari was ruined for military service. Returning to France, he landed in a military hospital, where he begged for a cure for his appetite. Nothing worked. He continued to eat everything in sight, and in some ways, the hospital was the wrong place for him to be. He hoarded hospital food and ate doctor's salves and medication. He drank from blood bags, snuck into the morgue at night to eat from unclaimed bodies, and generally freaked out the entire hospital staff with his lurking, increasingly vampiric presence. There were fierce debates among hospital staff as to whether Terrari should be sent to a mental asylum for the safety of their patients. But ultimately they decided to keep him so they might continue their tests and medical experiments on this singular biological specimen. This was a decision they would soon regret. It was only a short time later that a 14-month-old baby from a nearby room went missing. The nurses looked everywhere and, unable to explain this disappearance in any rational way, their thoughts eventually turned to the resident polyphagist. And something about the look in Terrari's eyes gave him away. He was immediately thrown out of the hospital and then himself disappeared for four years before resurfacing at a different hospital in Versailles. In the very least, we can all hope that in his cannibalism, he was during that time not a repeat offender. We can say that it would have been difficult for him to sneak up on people due to his overwhelming physical stench, which was documented in at least one medical journal. Terrare, says Professor Percy, was constantly covered with sweat, and from his body, always burning hot, a vapor arose, sensible to the sight and still more so to the smell. He often stinked to such a degree that he could not be endured with the distance of 20 paces. The journal continued. The patient was subject to flux from the bowels, and his dejections were fetid beyond all comprehension. And when he had not eaten copiously within a short time, the skin of his belly would wrap almost around his body. In the hospital in Versailles, Terrari developed 
and about the only part of his body that made any sense, a violent case of bleeding diarrhea, from which he never recovered. He was convinced at the time that the reason for his illness was a golden fork that he had stolen, which had lodged somewhere in his digestive tract. The more likely culprit was tuberculosis. In any event, he died in a great deal of pain, and all attempts to study his unusual body were compromised by the rapid pace as which his body decayed following his death. His insides were so damaged by his habits that they were more or less one giant festering sore. In the words of a reporting doctor, his body, as soon as he was dead, became a prey to a horrible corruption. The entrails were petrified, confounded together, and immersed in pus. The liver was exceedingly large, void of consistence, and in a putrescent state. The gallbladder was of considerable magnitude, the stomach in a lax state, and having ulcerated patches dispersed about it, covered almost the whole of the abdominal region. The stench of the body was so insupportable that M. Tizer, chief surgeon at the hospital, could not carry his investigation to any further extent. Now, as gross and disturbing as all of this sounds, keep in mind that we are talking about a medical disorder. This term, polyphagia, doesn't refer to someone who is always eating everything. It refers to a clinical disease. This diagnosis suggests an addiction, both physical and spiritual, something in Terrare's soul analogous to his wrinkled, empty cheeks and his cavernous, empty throat. No matter how much he ate, he could never be filled, and when he begged for help, no one could help him. His appetite reduced him to a kind of animal that would never be as at home in the company of other humans as he was in the gutter fighting animals for scraps. Many others have been diagnosed with the same disorder, and the symptoms are fairly consistent. Others, like Charles Domery and Antoine Languillette, have been skinny men who disliked cooked meat, as did Terrare. Much like Gollum from the Lord of the Rings epic, many true polyphagists prefer their meat raw and often wriggling. Even live animals is a reoccurring theme, and rotten meat is usually preferred to meat prepared in a more traditional manner. Dr. Bondenson has suggested a couple of brain abnormalities that may be behind this disorder. Though no definite research has been done, people like Terrari appear to suffer from a brain abnormality that prevents them from knowing when they are full. The part of the brain that regulates our appetites and tells us when enough is enough, it's damaged or simply undeveloped. Bondenson says, it is known that appetite is primarily regulated by two hypothalamic centers in the brain, a satiety center in the vitromedial nucleus and a feeding center in the lateral part of the hypothalamus. If this part of the brain shuts down, appetite becomes a dominant force in the human brain with nothing to slow it down. Additionally, injuries to the amygdaloid nuclei a small oval structure near the base of the brain, have been shown to cause human animals to develop a preference for tainted and rotten food, which might explain the polyphagist preference for spoiled meat. But who really knows? Science has been so far incapable of providing concrete explanations for this fortunately rare disorder. So often with history, what we learn is less about big dramatic takeaways and more about sympathy, empathy, and the incomprehensible depths of the human person. We learn how hard life can be and how awful and how the worst people in the world tend to also be victims in their own way. 
the story of Terare is a prime example of this. Hopefully through stories like Terare's, we learn to forgive people we don't understand, even as we learn to defend ourselves against them. And that alone makes remembering them worthwhile. But it's also a relief to return to more uplifting stories, as we will in the next episode, when we look at the life and tiny country of George Dibbern, who declared his independence from his native Nazi Germany and called himself a citizen of the world. He went so far as to create his own flag and passport and lived on Te Rupunga, his little boat that became for decades a floating nation of one.